leader of the BIM practice group. I'm joined here by Bob Wygant, and the uh, practice group leader, and, uh, and uh, Robert, uh, Rob Holson. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Uh, just going to give it a couple minutes for a few more folks to join us. People are still signing up. Uh, this is the uh, July 23rd virtual meeting of the CSI BIM practice group about to get underway. You should be able to see my screen uh, and all attendees uh, should be in listen only mode. Um, actually we want to try and uh, we don't have a huge group today and we want to try and encourage some discussion so I think I'm going to experiment with attempting to unmute people so that we can get some discussion going. Uh, we'll just have to see how the background noise goes. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the idea of you know, discussing Omniclass and BIM is that uh, Omniclass is it's a series of tables that have been around for some time now, but um, they're, with the advent of building information modeling have really been kind of brought to the forefront. They've you know, sort of sat dormant as uh, with a question surrounding it as, you know, how do you implement this and what do you do with it? So what I've done is kind of I've broken out each table into, um, into its, you know, it, it broken, it broken them out individually so we can kind of look at each one of them and say, well, here are some ideas of, of how you might be able to implement this into, uh, into uh, a BIM platform. Um, how it's being implemented today. There are certain tables that are already on the and then how to handle the other ones. So, uh, and, you know, looking at them, I, I, I'm really looking to get some feedback from, from everybody on uh, some strategies that might work for specifics uh, for, you know, say, uh, the, the firm that you're working for. Uh, how you might find a, a use for a specific table versus uh, some other people saying, well, there's you know, no real use for it. Hey, so. Aaron. Hi. Hi, Aaron. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for that. Uh, those opening comments, Bob. Um, attendees, uh, please be aware that most of you are unmuted. So uh, we're going to try this. So as Bob said, we can encourage some discussion. Uh, and I'm going to try to... Uh, manage that. Uh, if you have much trouble, then I'll have to mute everybody. But if you're if you're listening and you can mute your own device, uh, you, except when you want to talk, no, that would be good. Uh, I guess I'm right seeing the troubles already, Bob. Yeah, already. But let's give it a shot here. Um, so as Bob said, we're going to talk a little bit about Omniclass, what's been going on, and really try to put a perspective on impl implementing it and using it, maybe with the example of the, uh, uh, the properties table and how it could be implemented in a BIM authoring program as, a, as a one example of how that might work. Uh, so I guess we'll go ahead and uh, get into that. Uh, maybe just to point out, though, before we start, uh, we're uh, not planning to have a meeting in August. Uh, we're going to take a little summer break here. Uh, uh, Bob and I are both up in New England, and we don't get much summer. So uh, we're going to take uh, that day and uh, um, spend it not doing this. So what would be our regular meeting in August? But we will start up again in September, and we'll send out invitations and everything to everyone. And the notes from this meeting will reflect our plans to not have a meeting next month. Uh, so uh, one other uh, thing before we start, I, we're um, considering looking for a way to spread the um, scribing duties around. Uh, I've generally been taking, Joy started doing this, Joy Davis, and then I've been taking the notes from our meetings and we publish those on our blog. Uh, but if we have any other aspiring uh, note takers out there, um, we would welcome volunteers to help with the note taking process at one of our meetings and then we'll work with you to post those up on the CSI blog so you can uh, also get some blogging experience out of the, out of the uh, bargain. Uh, so if you think you might be interested in that, uh, please send me an email. 
uh, Roger Grant, R. Grant, uh, at csinet.org. And uh, I'll, I'll be happy to talk with you about what's involved. Uh, but again, we're, we're looking for some volunteers to help out. Uh, okay, I guess uh, that's enough, Bob. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, and uh, um, we'll jump into the presentation. Okay, great. Okay, let me just go through. And just let me know if uh, everybody can see my screen okay. Oh, yeah, and one last thing on the question. So you... Many of you are unmuted. Um, just speak up if and when you want to. If uh, you don't seem like you can, uh, yeah, we're hearing you. Uh, type me a question in the question box, and I'll unmute you so you can speak it out. Or I'll ask it if, for some reason, you don't have a mic or something. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Um, yeah. Like as Roger said. Uh, you know, please speak up on questions. I, I, I do like to field these um, as we go. As you know, we're, I sort of broke this out table by table, and it's just a couple of points on each one of them because there are uh, quite a few tables. Um, you know, I thought we could kind of go through them one at a time, show the ones that are being used versus the ones that uh, could be used, and the different ideas. And I, um, I'm you know trying to make this as interactive as possible. To, in addition to, uh, you know, let everybody learn, uh, to come up with some different implementation strategies that can be used uh, for the industry uh, that the software manufacturers may, you know, may be able to take a lead from. Uh, and then, in addition, uh, over time, over this uh, coming over this coming year, I'd be interested in putting together something of a, a CSI white paper as a, as a practice group. Uh, that speaks to how Omniclass and the various standards and formats that CSI has can be effectively implemented into BIM uh, to, to share that with, with the membership and beyond uh, that to really help uh, to help grow Omniclass as a technology. Um, yeah, and Bob, so I think, Bob, I just want to point out that this could also fit in with this initiative we've been trying to get started to write some uh, guidelines for uh, uh, the use of BIM for CSI's different uh, practice areas. So right, you know, yeah, the tables and cool. the practice areas kind of line up, and so I think this could help complement that effort. Okay, thanks, Roger. Five, six, seven, eight, um, okay, so Omniclass, uh, it's, a, it's a series of tables that have been around for some time. Uh, but have sort of laid, uh, laid dormant uh, because there was really no strategy in place on implementing them effectively. So, you know, they were used um, in bits and pieces. Uh, as a whole, there wasn't much opportunity for them to be used. Uh, a lot of them just, it was, it, was, it was so much information that it was very difficult to, to even consider implementing it. But with the advent of BIM, uh, if you build these formats into everything that you do, uh, it becomes second nature and it allows a computer to be able to, to do the analysis and organize the information and, and see all of the aspects and attributes of, a, of not only a project, but uh, you know, taking the project, looking back, looking into the project based on its assemblies, looking into the assemblies based on its products, looking at the products based on its um, based on its um, materials and looking at its materials based on its, on its uh, physical attributes. So you can, you can really break everything down to its simplest form and be able to uh, qualify the information. Um, you, know, you, may, you may look at it and say, well, what use is this? And that's really what I'm trying to determine. Uh, I, I found a lot of uses for many of these tables, but uh, some of them I'm, I'm sort of scratching my head and looking looking to those that are in practice on a day-to-day -day basis uh, for ways that, that people might find to, uh, to actually put some of these tables into practice. So the first, you know, first couple of tables uh, discuss the construction entities for the entire, the entire project itself. So whether you're dealing with a, 
uh, whether you're dealing with a tower or a, an antenna or a building or a bridge, it classifies the overall project. Um, drilling into that, you have the spaces within, uh, within those projects. So it goes from project level down to the spaces within the project. So is it a room? Is it a hallway? Is it a common area? Is it a bath? Is it um, you know, what, what have you? It, you know, classifying all these, these spaces. Um, and then it, it breaks even further into the elements where the, now this table is actually in, cur in, in current use uh, as, as uniform. And uh, so it, that really classifies the, the assemblies within a, within a project. So you're looking at not just the, comp not just the, the project itself and not an individual component, but somewhere in the middle of it, where a wall has several different materials that make that 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 compose it or comprise it, and, but being able to look at that wall as a whole and, and classify the information within uh, becomes very you know very effective. You know, currently it's, it's most commonly used for costing. Um, and then Table 22 work results. Uh, everybody everybody will probably most notably know it for being master format. Um, it, it allows the ability to you know, classify things based on uh, what was actually done. Um, and, and so a window can, can be made up of not just the actual window that you buy from a manufacturer, but the, uh, you know, the associated flashings and, and anything that, that's necessary to actually create that installation. Uh, and there's a big cross-reference between uh, uniformat and master formats in many places. Others, there's not not a clear cut of a of a um, uh, of a connection. Um, the the most the, the newest one that's really been brought to the forefront is the Table 23 Products Table, which Autodesk has recently implemented into Revit, which has been, uh, in, in my estimation, a great a great thing because it allows you to look at uh, an actual. Yeah, can you guys close the door, where, please? Uh, um, where, uh, and it, when you have a product that may be used Sarah? across multiple disciplines or Can you close the multiple, door, please? Um, uh, multiple disciplines or, or uh, in multiple specification sections, you can find those products. A, a good example would be concrete. You might find, you might find concrete in, in many different places uh, versus, uh, versus just in casting place concrete. So if you're trying to count it, qualify it, uh, you can you can use the products table, and you can. All, I mean, there's a, a few different other examples that will that I'll show as we go. Um, and then we break into some some tables that I kind of look at as, as almost information filters or cross references, where you deal with the different phases of a project, the different services, uh, the different the, the disciplines and organizational roles, which are the people that are working on the project, tools and information. Materials, which is sort of a, a, a higher level view of products, uh, and then Table 49 properties, which uh, I was I would I had actually worked on some development of um, to to get things going on creating something of a of a taxonomy or a structure for uh, for terms that are used for construction. Um, to get into this, uh, just to start, if anybody has any questions. Um, about what Omni class is, I, I'm you know, happy to field them. If not, I can start moving into a couple of individual tables. No? Okay. Well, um, I'll start with construction entity by function. And really what this is, is um, it's a classification of the entire building based on its, based on its environment. So um, you know, looking at the, looking at this, uh, looking at the, the graphic over here, this is, um, uh, the Omniclass table actually as it sits on the Omniclass.org site, uh, there was actually just a very large initiative by CSI to update a uh, considerable number of the tables. So uh, what I'm actually using is, is you know, going to be updated very shortly, but the, uh, or replaced, I should say, with information that's, that's more updated. Um, so you know, it classifies, this table classifies the entire building based on its environment. Uh, so it, when you're looking at, you know, say a large area, um, when you're looking at a large area, you can see, you can kind of 
scope out the area and say, okay, well, uh, we're in a town, the town needs schools, and it needs a police station, it needs a fire station. And you can sort of look at, look at it from a very big picture or a 10,000 foot view and make a determination and really classify, okay, here's, here's public service buildings, we're going to group those all over here. Here are, here are town offices, we're going to group those all over here. Um, and, you know, it's great for, for pre-planning and planning, doing feasibility studies and, and as I said, city and area mapping. Um, and if anybody has any, any additional ideas on how something like this could be, could be um, uh, beneficial to a project, uh, you know, I'm all ears. Um, but, you yeah, know, this is one of those tables that it, 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 it's great for pre-planning, but uh, above and beyond that, you know, is there a use for it? Um, you know, next table is, is very similar in nature where it's rather than construction uh, entities by function, it's by form. And uh, it really, it, it does the same thing, but it speaks more to uh, what it is. Is this a high-rise building? Is this a low-rise building? Uh, it speaks to the shape of it, and uh, so you can kind of categorize uh, the types of buildings. If you, uh, if you're, you can only have a certain percentage of of the construction that's over a certain height, you can sort of very quickly go through a large scope and make a determination of, of what needs to be done. Again, these are these are some tables that may or may not find its way into any uh, any more than analysis. But um, as it stands, these the, the tables uh, do give the ability to classify a lot of information. Um, on the, 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 the very high project level, you know, um, uh, costing and uh, and feasibility studies. Um, then we get into uh, yeah, space <coughs> by function. Uh, this is, I mean, this is more big picture stuff as well. Project level information and facility management. So you can look at uh, you can look at the spaces within a building. And classify them for uh, facility management. I mean, this is this is a table that I see being implemented into into BIM very easily uh, when the model is going to be used for downstream purposes. Um, it, as you design a building, and you can make determinations of what the space is being used for. Uh, you can you can um, classify it based on rented space, and you can you know sort of look at budgetary considerations of how much is it going to cost to maintain these spaces, uh, whether it's a dormitory versus whether it's a clean room. Uh, you know, a dormitory is going gonna, is gonna to be, uh, need to be built in a lot more durable of a sense and making their, their uh, determinations of how to, be, how to build based on more spaces kind of gives you the ability to cross-reference the space versus the overall design. Uh, so you can look at it, you know, is this a recording studio, is it a copy room, is it a bedroom? Um, and in addition, you can you can link specific locations to a specific task or even a person. So you know, I could I could you know uh, in a building on a on a project, be able to look at something and say, uh, you know, this is Bob's office. So you can map an entire facility for um, you know for everything from network wiring uh, all the way out to all the way out to um, you know fire protection and uh, and egress exit. Bob, what about people who uh, are? Hey, yeah, somebody, Bob, yeah. Bob, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yes, I can. Yeah, it's Roger. What, what about people who are, you know, maybe just wanting to organize information from past projects, um, you know, not necessarily even inside a model, but just to organize their specifications or their um, libraries of projects? Um, you know, do you think? I mean. These tables would be good to use for that. I'm just wondering if anybody's doing that, or um, they maybe this mostly happens in the application you're using to manage your content. I, um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a really good point. I mean, I, I have been pretty much looking at this more more on the uh, within the application side rather than outside of the application. And when you're you know uh, looking at your own internal business, you could use the you know, construction construction entities by function uh, and form 
to look at the types of buildings that have been built and sort of be able to almost template the, um, template the projects that you've done for future building. So, you know, you look at, you, you look at your internal projects and say, here's the hospitals that I've done, um, and say, okay, here are the commonalities of them. I could almost create a template based on the commonalities. So, uh, internally, that's, that's actually a really good idea to be able to look at, look at uh, the um, inventory, if you will, that uh, a, a given firm has put together and uh, classify them based on different based on different types. So you could you could functionally template uh, for for specific projects that may come up in the future, and that could that could certainly streamline uh, work pro workflow processes in the future. So I wonder if anybody's doing that in the in the listening audience. <clears throat> well, um, this is Deb McPherson. I I think that uh, this especially the facilities by function can be used by a lot of people outside of the AE industry like for example um, there's city models being made these days there's a lot of public safety kind of efforts where they don't have facility types very organized and a lot of times they'll just kind of ad hoc make these lists of different types of facilities and use these words like you know hotel when they just kind of make up words and there's some building types like uh, big box stores and that sort of thing that you see around cities all the time now that aren't in those lists. And so there seem, anybody who I've mentioned it to seems to be pretty open-minded to using the facility types rather than just making things up and having incomplete lists. That seems like a useful one. Uh, so, uh, thanks for the input on that. That's a, it's a, a, a great way of looking at it is, you know, from city planning and, and being able to classify things so everybody's sort of using the same terminology. Okay, um, moving on. Um, similar to uh, spaces by function and spaces by form, um, where you're looking at it, uh, again, at project level information organization, but, uh, but not basing it on a, on a general category, uh, or but basing it on a general category, not really what, being, what it's being used for. Um, you know, it's it's not Bob's office. It's you know, this is an office. So uh, it, it's more for you know, general space planning. Uh, for say, you're doing a tenant fit out during a, you know during the sale of a building, or uh, as as spaces are being changing hands, uh, being able to look at it and say, okay, well here, here you know, we we're renting 15,000 square feet, and 10,000 of it or 5,000 of it is common area, and you know, 500 of it is, is restroom facilities, and so you can really see what percentage of, of your rented or of your of your leased space is, um, you know, can be used for functional purposes, uh, and really make determinations of, of good, effective uh, purposes. I mean, I can see real estate being able to to use uh, uh, spaces by form to be able to analyze a building very quickly. Uh, for its usefulness for different uh, for different types of buildings. So, okay, okay well, you know, a, uh, if you're running a, I don't know, a, a, a photo studio, you need more open space than you do enclosed space, so you can make determinations of, you know, is this a good fit for this type of building, uh, and very quickly be able to classify uh, classify the types of buildings uh, or um, the, the types of buildings based on the spaces within to make determinations of what they could or could not be used for. Um, I see it as sort of a as, as sort of a retasking when you're retasking a uh, building. Um, it, it can be a really good opportunity uh, to implement that in, uh, in there. Okay, uh, moving on is uh, uh, uniform at table twenty one elements. Um, this is something that's that's you know in use today. Uh, the uh, cost estimators use it often to make determinations of, of you know, square foot cost and, and uh, preliminary cost of a building. Being able to look at it based on, on an overall assembly uh, and, and relevance within the project. So, you know, when you look at when you look at a window, let's look at everything associated with the window. When you look at a wall, let's look at everything associated with the wall. Um, and you know, a, a HVAC system. Uh, break broken down into its smaller parts, but then also looked at as an entire assembly. 
<coughs> um, and it, you know, it acts as a reference between the assembly and the BIM model. So you can query you can query any model based on um, uh, query any model based on unit format to kind of spit out a list of here's all the the elements that are being used, and then a, it basically affix a um, uh, a cost value to it and and look at it that way to to get some baseline cost information. Um, you know, it, it doesn't go very deep into into the information within a project, but uh, I think it, it, a lot of it is how deep do you need to go, and it's good, that's going to be determined based on the individual firm and the individual project that it's being worked on. Um, you know, it, 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 as 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 information grows, you know, we need qualification data, descriptors, quantification data uh, as far as you know performance of different components. Uh, but the one important aspect to, to, to note is that, is that this is currently being used in BIM platforms. Revit, I know, is using it. Um, and, it, it, you know, the, the cost estimators have the ability to pop the information back out. Um, I'm starting to look at it for, uh, you know, for uh, PPDs and, um, you know, pre-planning documents uh, to use it that way as well. Uh, so you can look at it in terms of not just, not just uh, costing and, and but also planning of the entire project based on these elements. It's probably also worth noting, Bob, that the uh, the new um, AIA uh, guidelines on integrated project delivery um, use Uniformat uh, in their <coughs> level of detail matrix to establish uh, mm -hmm. what uh, percentage can or level of detail is present in the model at a particular phase, not mm -hmm. percentage complete. But. Right, yeah, it's a, you know, so you, you can, it's, a, it's a good, accurate descriptor. That's going to drive some more usage of it, I think. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think once, once, um, once there's, there, I think once there's more information contained within the model that needs to be queried, uh, people are going to be querying it in in different ways. So you may not be looking at it necessarily in, in terms of master format. You may be looking at it in terms of something else. In, in which case, uniformat might be the, uh, the the better way to organize the information. And that's really what you know cost estimators have have found over the years. So. Um, but moving on, the specifier relies on master. Uh, so as you as you deal with the information, uh, if we if we hope to make some sort of connection between uh, the specifications and the BIM models, um, or, or the projects done in a BIM, uh, table 22 or master format really is is the general hook. So you can look into you can look into a model and clarify what is in there based on the master format number. And so from there, you could kind of spit out, okay, here are all the components that are in the model based on master format. And it sort of becomes a baseline from which to develop a spec. And as more information goes into the model, that baseline becomes more fleshed out. So, um, you know, master format, it's a Categorization of work results. It's not just uh, it's not just what it is, but um, what it takes to implement it as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a it's a it's a top level piece of information. It's a cross reference, and it's also it also acts as a keynote for for drawings. Um, and you know, but again, just as just with unit format, uh, you know, we need more information going into these models uh, in terms of qualification and quantification. And again, you know, this is also it's currently being used in Revit, so it, it's being implemented into into the BIM platforms uh, to allow people to um, to organize their information. And right now, uh, it you know, I'd have to say it's probably the most common commonly used uh, data organizer. Whether you you know you look at it in terms you look at information in terms of logical categories that are embedded in the software package, you know, whether you look at windows or doors or mechanical equipment or lighting or electrical, um, that you can organize information that way. But you can also look at information in terms of um, of the master format number, because you may have you may have elements of multiple categories 
inside of a given mesh and call that number. So it's just another way of looking at the information inside the project. Um, and now the, the, the newest the newest addition to the implementation to, to you know BIM implementation is table point three product. Uh, in in Revit 2010 they they implemented uh, the Omniclass table twenty three into each one of the into the uh, the families uh, that are built in. So that you know it starts with a it, with uh, automatically classifying it. Uh, based on its category, and then it allows you to kind of customize it. So you know, it starts if you open up a door family, it starts as just basic door. But then you can you can categorize that uh, more definitively as you as you build out that door and make a determination. Okay, this is a sectional overhead door, or this is a uh, a, a flood door, or just a swing door, uh, aluminum. You can you can uh, categorize that. And then there's the ability to, to look at the individual products and count actual products within a project. So you can get a, a hard number, which is useful for quantity takeoffs. It's useful for cost information. It's useful for scheduling. Um, you know, you could you could use this very. This could be extremely helpful for you know door hardware, for instance. If you're creating door hardware schedules and you want to look at information and say, I only need to know what exit devices are in there. Or I need to know the exit devices and I know you need to know which manufacturer or hers are on the project. Um, so you can look at the you can look at the products, not the work result, not the element. So you're just looking at the product. Um, you know, and then you know when you're looking at stuff that's like a you know, concrete or plywood or paints and coatings, that you may find these things all over the project. Being able to count them quickly and easily is uh, is really beneficial, uh, especially if you're dealing with something uh, something where you where you need to need you either need to know exactly how much concrete is going to be on the project or uh, how much wood is on the project because you're trying to calculate something for lead credit or uh, you have a material that that is listed as a um, you know a steel with recycled content or uh, you know uh, how it, it, when you're looking at that recycled content, this is one way to do it. Another way to do it is the table that we're looking at down the road, uh, which is the materials table. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess I can kind of switch over to Revit real quickly, um, which show how it's been implemented. I just opened up a, a, a basic family uh, that is done. It's a, a sectional overhead door, um, and you know when you look at doors, you it gives you the ability to open it up and classify it based on exactly what it is. So you look at you look at uh, you know openings, doors, and um, doors by material, doors by method of operation, which is probably the most effective way to classify this. And then you have overhead doors, and then you have sectional overhead doors. So you really have a, a good ability to classify each individual component down to its end level. So people can, uh, you, you can get a very firm sense of exactly what components are going in. So if you cross-reference, if you cross-reference table 23 with uh, the master format numbers that are associated with it, uh, you can you can almost develop, uh, you can, you, you're, you're almost halfway there, if not further, on developing the specification because you have specifics. You have specific components. It's not just a door, and it's not just and, and it's not just an overhead door. It's a sectional overhead door. So it gets you much closer. And then from in from in here, you can start looking at at the specific attributes that go into it. But we'll start looking at that a little bit further. Um, and now we're starting to get into some some different Bob, tables that are a little bit Bob, more ethereal. And they, Bob, yeah. it's Roger. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it might be worth pointing yes, out to people. Uh, an implementation of the products table is uh, there's a group of federal agencies that are implementing Maximo, and they're using the products table as the basis for how they identify the equipment uh, that they want to manage in Maximo, which is a computerized maintenance management system. And uh, this idea of using a standard way of naming those um, pieces of equipment or objects that they're interested in managing um, is 
is uh, where they're going. And you can see where if you had a model on the front end, um, once you passed it over to the owner, they could start to also connect the model to their management system for you know, doing lots of different uh, things down the road with uh, how they keep track of what changes they've made to the model over time or uh, uh, other activities that might be involved simulations or things on uh, that, that use the model's capabilities but keep it current with the building. Yeah, that's that's actually a really good uh, that's a really good example. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and in thinking of it, I mean, contractors can contractors could potentially, um, you know, if they have access to querying the model, getting the information back out, yeah, there's the potential to be able to tie it into uh, into their um, own uh, construction so like, the software or their so estimation like, software. So, so they can kind of I put a cost know. to each one of these. I'll have to look into that. Of these, uh, I'll you know, see what I can. 23 items and say, okay, if I'm dealing with a uh, aluminum case with yeah, window, I think you gave me a link it, to you know, my cost and I don't know if I got all the files. You know, files this is how much it costs. And, and, and being able to put that together a bit very quickly and easily based on that. I'd be interested to see if anybody has actually has actually used the information from Table 23 that, that is built into Revit, whether anybody has exported it and is, and is using it in the schedule. So uh, if anybody has, uh, yeah, I'd, like to, I'd love to hear uh, some experiences that anyone might have. OK. Well, um, moving on, uh, phases is, um, you know, this is kind of, this is, a, uh, we're getting into the tables that are a bit more, you know, ethereal in nature where you know, there's some uncertainty as to how to implement it and uh, and what it can be, how it can benefit. Um, you know, phases really what what it, what it shows are the, the commonly seen phases in traditional design methods. Uh, so you have you know you have uh, uh, preliminary preliminary project description. You have design development, construction documentation. Uh, it goes into the the, the basic. Um, the basic phases, and then it breaks it out a little bit further into its into its uh, you know smaller component parts. So you have the ability to you know say you're working on a on, a, on an ITD project or a fast track project where things are you know there's multiple things happening at the same time. It may you may find it easier to to be able to organize these things and look at at you know project status if you can uh, if you and you know where it is and where it should be. Uh, if you can organize all of this information. Now, if you have multiple individuals on a project and you're all tracking your own information, um, you could sort of, it gives you the ability to cross-reference it um, if you're all using you know, information from, say, a basis table. Um, so that, that way everybody's kind of on a level playing field saying, uh, here are, you know, we're on this phase and this is where we are, and we're on this phase and this is where we are, you can kind of Line everything up and see, uh, and see every, if everything is on track or if it's behind, or and how far behind or how far ahead. Um, and you can, you know, the the bid attributes can uh, uh, can be attached to the different phases to classify the level of detail of the information at various points of, points of the project. So during during uh, you know preliminary during uh, preliminary design. You only need to know these specific attributes. So these attributes are tied to that. And during you know, design development, you want to know a little bit more. During the CD phase, you want to know the information that you find in the spot. Uh, you want, when you're in procurement, the uh, manufacturers need to know specific information, and the and the contractors need to know specific information. During construction, uh, you know others, uh, the contractors and subcontractors need to know specific things. So if you can organize that information and cross-reference it based on the phases, uh, you can almost filter out the information uh, so you're not trying to look at way too much information inside the model all at once. Uh, excuse me, Bob? Yes. Um, Brian Lightheart actually typed a question into the, um, to the questions tab there. He was just wondering, did you say Maximo is using table 23? Uh, Rob, I, I, uh, that was my comment. Um, 
And uh, I think I respond to Brian, but the, um, okay. the answer is that, no, it's not currently using Table 23, but there's a, some government agencies that are implementing it are planning to use it in their implementation. It could go further to being available in Maximo, but it's not at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, and now uh, this is this is where we're going to start to get into uh, where I'm really looking for some uh, some user feedback uh, or from you know some some feedback from you guys. We're starting to get into some tables that I've been sort of scratching my head on and saying, you know, okay, these are these are you know it's good it's good information and it, it's well organized, but um, just as just as uh, it, it took BIM to, uh, to implement, you know, it takes BIM to implement these tables that we're discussing now, you know, is BIM going to be able to implement all of them? And what would it, you know, is there something larger that might, uh, that might come about to develop tables or, or find uses for things like Table 32 services? Um, you know, the, the idea is that it classifies specific tasks performed on a project to the role that's thought for it. Um, so, you know, th this looks at, um, you know, the construction, the con it, during execution, here's all the, the different construction services, uh, you can attach a role to it. Uh, does anybody think that this is something that uh, could be useful within a BIM, or is this something that's just sort of pie in the sky, it's a great table, and, but it's just not, it, it just doesn't lend itself to BIM? Yeah, if anybody has any uh, any thoughts on this, well, I'll, I'll jump in. No this is, uh, lightheart again. Um, yes. This 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 bunch of tables, uh, uh, services, uh, roles, tools, <laughs> information is kind of a different cat, but but they all uh, are currently not modeled in, in a in a in a building information model. Uh, now, right, or, or what I think of as a building information model, they're, they're, they may be modeled in uh, uh, in other applications that are the, the data is drawn from a building information model, uh, and and I don't know a whole lot about those applications. They're they're happening in facilities management, or they're happening in yeah. contracting, uh, and so there, true. I would think these would be useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and a lot of this is sort of looking at building information modeling as not just Revit or Bentley or Graphisoft, but, you know, the, the extension of that into, uh, after, the, after the model is created in one of those platforms, that building information uh, comes out and goes into some sort of, you know, some sort of, um, you know, facility management database, but it's still building information management, if you will. So, you know, it, um, you know, it may not, it may not end itself up in say platform of uh, of Reddit, but in some sort of facility management software platform, it could, you know, it could find itself as useful. Or construction management might be a better example. Disciplines, same thing. Uh, you know, we're getting into we're getting into some of these tables where you know, if anybody has any ideas of, of this, I mean, this you know classifies specific areas of practice to the tasks that are performed. You know, uh, a mason, a carpenter, an iron worker, uh, a tiler, a painter. You know, so you can sort of look at the overall the, the overall scope of the project and sort of uh, address. Uh, who's responsible for it? I mean, you know, top of my head, I think, okay, well, maybe for for legal purposes, you can sort of create a um, chain of responsibility for you know who installed something based on the assembly. So you have uh, this master for that section number, and this was installed by uh, these people. Uh, so this person installed, uh, you know, this discipline installed this master for that number. 
And that's just something that's kind of off the top of my head. I don't know if it's actually useful or if it's, you know, not. But um, the, the idea is there. So. Well, Bob, I know, uh, Mr. Roger, one place this gets used is in the uh, IDM uh, information delivery man manual uh, mapping process for defining exchanges. It's useful to, you know, you need to uh, establish who's using uh, different parts of the model at different stages. And so this being having standard names for who you're passing things to is helpful. Um, it's kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, not a direct usage, but an indirect one in modeling processes um, and defining processes. So yeah, at least there's some consistency in how we identify the different uh, um, people involved or entities involved. Is there a general contractor in the house? I don't hear one. I don't hear what um, I would. I'd really. I'd love to hear from one because this is where. This is one where I think. I think this is uh, design build firms or or general contractors um, would be able to sort of classify their work uh, and the subcontractors that are working for them uh, based on this type of stuff and be able to sort of divvy up the work um, and and keep it organized. So, uh, moving on. Um, uh, again, tools. All right. Well, you know, how much do you really need to classify a hammer and saw uh, in a in a BIM project? Again, this this is one that I see kind of creeping back to the to the general contractor, where um, you know they may be able to uh, look at you know wear and tear on on equipment and and you know add that into add that into their cost of information and say, okay, well these are the tools that are used in installing a window. So we need to take into consideration um, you know what the wear and tear is. But I, I think I'm reaching I'm really reaching on that. Um, so it, you know if any if any if, if anybody knows of any implementation strategies for a table like tools, um, love to hear it. Uh, but uh, you know, I I'm sort of looking at this as, you know, I'm not sure that this applies to BIM as a technology. Um, Bob, I can say in doing uh, this is uh, Bob, this is another. I I can say in doing yeah. non-BIM modeling, we would uh, model um, crews that you would use for different tasks, and so you would both use the previous table, which has disciplines, and the tools table to make up the composition of crews that you're going to use um, for different tasks and then um, you could you know, model how much was needed for a particular um, unit of work, for example. Uh, and so you, know, you could certainly apply that in modeling the construction phase. I don't think in the design phase it's going to be nearly as uh, uh, useful. Well, but, but at the same time, I mean, you know, I, I you know, you don't. I don't know that you really design what tools are being used into a project, other than you know, other than you know, very large componentry like cranes and 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 very heavy equipment that that you know may need to be taken into consideration during design. So you don't trap a crane in the middle of a stadium that's being built. Well, um, not hand, but, not know, hand tools, part, but many other tools. You would certainly their behavior and their right. existence. I, mean, you know, I think it's as a, as a large scale. Right. Um, but it, <clears throat> working to that level seems, you know, that's really reaching to the, you know, the, the terminus of, of information uh, because a lot of times the person who's going to be working on that information may have no idea what tools go into a specific task. So, um, you know, and when you start getting to that terminus of information, where is the information designed to flow? So if it's if it's just for you know if it's just referential, that's one thing. But if it's designed for something else, uh, the question is what is it designed for? Um, and now you know now we get into information, which is um, you know that's a head scratcher. Uh, you know, I heard, uh, 
somebody had said before, you know, that's a whole whole different cat. But um, I I agree. Um, you know, what do we do with this table? Um, it it has a lot of well information in it, um, and it, it allows you to kind of classify the project information. But how does that differ from uh, say table 49 properties where um, you have information, you know, you're classifying information in table 49 and then you have a table for information. Uh, you know, I'm all ears for those who might want to kind of pipe up on that. Quite a bunch to that. Which is kind of funny because it was the day that we decided to open up. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, uh, this uh, the word the okay. prefix the prefix meta occurs to me. In other words, uh, maybe I've got maybe I've got a, 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 a building model and an estimating application that's pooping out some kind of some kind of reports, and I've got a, a schedule a software that's pooping out some other kind of reports. Uh, this is almost like an index to the whole. To the whole thing, I would think. In other words, where do I, you know, where do I go to find uh, the information I'm asked? But it doesn't fit into any one of those. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, so this um, is sort of a, a very high-level table contents. So that. Uh, I was going to say the way I understood it, the difference between the information table and the properties table was that that the information table contained a lot of uh, the environmental factors and some things that you can't change, like you can't change the wood, wind speed of a site, you can't change things like the owner's name, you know, they're just, they're how you start the project, they're your, your base of what you begin with. And then the properties table is what you design to. So you end up having a window that has whatever classification be in response to this wind speed and in response to being on the 10th floor. Does that um, make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, but I mean, that, that seems like it's only a part of the information table, though. Just, you know, in looking at this screen capture that I have in front of it, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, at everything from um, you know, maps, calendars, economic information, so it's it's uh, you know there's information that's also that's also referential uh, that almost almost doesn't apply you know yellow pages as a directory um, you know where does this tie in um, or does then tie into this table somehow saying you know this is just, uh, you know bin is a part of, of this whole. So, well, I mean, that's, you know, this is one of those tables that it's definitely a head scratcher. I'm not sure where it's going to land. Uh, and then, you know, moving in, we're coming into the tail end of this. Um, <clears throat> table 41 materials. It's a, sort of a less detailed and more general version of, of Table 23 products. Um, you know, I see it as useful in being able to classify, quantify how much, say, let's say, HASNAT or VOCs on a, on a, a BIM project. Uh, so you can you can you, know, you can look at it and say, all right, well, you know, we have all these hazardous materials on the project. There's a prop, um, and also you know, being for me, being able to look at actual materials on a project and qualify, you know, renewable recycled content uh, based on the composition and the material rather than the product itself. So you look at, all right, well, um, this product is made, you know, this product has a part of the product that's made up of recycled. You know, that means, you know, they use a, 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 a PVC window that has, a, you know, an aluminum, a recycled aluminum nailing fin. Well, the nailing fin might be made of recycled aluminum, but the rest of it is not. So really, who cares? It's, and being able to kind of look at percentage in terms of of of, 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 of the overall, not not just, uh, and be able to maybe maybe qualify a little bit more accurately 
uh, things of that nature, and, and VOC offsets, for instance, based on the material. So if you have different paints in different places on the project, and you want to do a VOC offset, you have you know, 10,000 10, gallons of this paint and one gallon of that paint that's you know, uh, a zillion parts per, you know, a zillion gallons per liter of, uh, uh, or grams per liter of a VOC. Uh, and you want to do an offset, gives you, it, there's a potential to be able to run that type of, um, of calculation. And finally, the last table that I know Deb and I both hold near and dear to our hearts is uh, Table 49 Properties, which we spent a lot of time updating. The one on the site really um, does no justice to what we have, what we have uh, accomplished. Um, you know, we've, we've built a standard enumerated taxonomy of, of uh, a whole lot of different properties uh, within a project. There's about eight or nine hundred of them that are used, and uh, you know it's sort of act, it's designed to act as a universal taxonomy to unify and quantify physical properties of, of the components and elements in a project. Uh, you know, you know it can it can potentially become a master list of the attributes that are used in SPI. The, the, ta the, the, the terminology, task teams, uh, IFD, um, but it's still under development. And you know, we need to define a lot of these terms. And this is where it gets a little bit difficult because uh, there's so much cross-discipline information that it's larger than three to four people working on a task team to develop it. Um, you know, we're looking for more people to uh, sort of look at the different attributes, in a, uh, attributes especially the ones that apply to certain disciplines like HVAC or plumbing, and, and get, get uh, some definition to exactly what it means. Um, you, know, uh, you know, what does pressure drop mean? And, uh, you know, what does beam mean if you're talking to a lighting person? What does beam mean if you're talking to a structural engineer? Um, and getting these types of things in, uh, clarified so we can release a uh, we can release a table that, that can be used by the masses. So, you know, we're looking for anybody who's interested in getting involved. Uh, it is a work in progress. We have a draft table that's uh, that's being finalized and, and getting ready for distribution as a draft. Uh, but we, you know, we don't want to stop there. We'd like to see it, uh, see future, see further development, so we can have it actually uh, set out as a release. Well, and, um, and you know, on a you know, uh, on a personal. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was going to say that that's one thing that definitely would be great to have CSI involved in more, more people from the chapters, more people around the country that to have something more like Wikipedia where there'll be there'll be a term and they'll say, well, in computer science it means this, in this type of thing it means this. So something like pressure drop is going to have a different meaning, different values, different performance criteria based on which kind of material. So it's like what really is needed is people to, to chime in from all those different perspectives and try and capture this in, in something like a website for this table to really work because it's almost like you said it's the universal taxonomy which means it's really just going to point to a lot of different places it's not going to be like the other tables where the you know the authoritative definition the consensus definition for one version of a term is in here it's always just sort of a gateway to different perspectives on on how these other properties are based on the materials, based on context. Without the context and without a value of you know, 0.02, the properties need that to mean anything. Right, exactly. Without context, um, it, it has no value. Right. Um, and to, you know, to just show, I had actually developed a shared parameter file based on um, uh, based on uh, this table 49 draft. So uh, it gives it gives the ability for at least inside of Revit to be able to look in, and and insert as as useful parameters into into the project um, all of the attributes. Now. Uh, you know, one downside of the shared parameter file is that I don't have the ability to really drill down 
past one level. So I'd actually created uh, one very large shared parameter file. Unfortunately, each one of the each one of the lists, you know, say performance properties, has a ton. So what I'm actually thinking about doing is um, is actually breaking this into multiple shared parameter files, so that you have one, you have seven shared parameter files: one for identification, one for location, performance, physical, facility services, time, money, and source. So each one of those, each one of those um, categories would be its own file. So it gives you the ability to drill in first by selecting the shared parameter file, and then by selecting the attribute. So it's a little bit. It, it, it's a little bit more um, user friendly that way, but you know, I I am I do have this available for people to try out as a, as sort of a beta version. Uh, if anybody wants to wants to try it out, I'm always looking for people to uh, uh, to test it out. You can email me, and I could send you the text file to use inside of Reddit. Bob, I think we've run out of time. Yes. Oh, wow. We have. Um, but just real quick, uh, you know, sort of a conclusion. That I came also, in, so I can barely hear you for some reason. Uh, than, uh, hmm. um, oh, there we is that go. any better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. BIM data drills in much further than assemblies and work results. Uh, OmniClass can, can organize information to a far deeper level than the existing formats because of all these different tables. Uh, analysis can be performed only if the taxonomy and formatting are unified. So you know, we need to put all this information together so that it's computer readable uh, in order for, for good analysis to be performed. And then as more parties become involved uh, in a project, the need for standardized data becomes compounded. Now you're, if you have one person, it's important to keep your, your own information organized. When you have 10 people, it's necessary. And then as, as BIM software becomes more intelligent and more self-aware, uh, the standardized terminology is, is critical for analysis. So that's what I had. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out. I'm sorry I ran over. But, um, you know, unfortunately, it didn't really need much time for questions and comments. But, you know, the idea was to take them as we went. And, uh, you know, I'll be uh, – I'm – Available to um, you know answer any questions. If you want to email me, feel free. Uh, if you if you'd like to um, get a copy of the uh, of my share parameter file, it's robertsnextdesign.com. And um, with that, uh, I don't think we have any more uh, housekeeping stuff other than we are not going to have a meeting next month, but in September I uh, expect to see a um, you know a meeting announcement. Not sure that we picked an exact date, but it's probably the third Friday of September. And from there, um, that's all I had. Well, thank you everybody for taking an hour with us on a on a you know summer afternoon. Thank well, you. thanks, Bob. Um, and uh, we'll see everybody in two months. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.